In this video, we're going to be talking about frequency dependent selection or the process by which natural selection sometimes favors the rare look or the common look. Now, this is actually something that we already talked about when we talked about aposomatic correlation. On the last video, we mentioned that there needs to be enough of these organisms that look strange in order for the message to get across to the predator, which is why things like Mullerian mimicry actually even evolved, because there's going to be an advantage if there's more than one organism all working together to send a message to say to the predators, avoid this color pattern because it's going to be dangerous. So it's only going to work if there's enough people in the population that have this. In other words, it's common enough. So that's an example of why natural selection would put pressure for something to look the same. There's also sometimes pressure for things to look different from each other, for it to be diversity. So there's two types of frequency-dependent selection. There's negative selection or diversifying selection, and then there's positive selection or purifying selection. And I remember this because in negative selection, for example, I think of it as a little kid that's saying, oh, I cannot eat this again. I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. I want something different. So it's like natural selection trying to diversify. It's negative against things that look the same. So a great example of this is going to be, for example, alleles in flowers or the pollen. Flowers have mechanisms sometimes where they will have both genders inside the same flower. And they do a lot to try to avoid self-fertilization sometimes because, of course, that will lower the variety that exists in the population. So plants would like to actually cross with different plants in order for this to succeed. And there's a lot of mechanisms that will go about doing that. One of the mechanisms is, of course, they put the pistol, which is the female part, higher than the stem, which is the male part. And by doing that, they avoid some of the pollen falling into side the female part but and there's a lot of other things they will do as well but one of the cool things they do is there's actually a genetic mechanism where if the alleles of the pollen are too similar to the alleles of the egg that sits inside the ovule the plant will prevent fertilization from taking place enzymes will destroy the pollen before it actually gets the chance to, to fertilize the egg and that's really cool because what it's doing is creating pressure for the pollen to be different you know because of that then there's what we call negative selection or diversifying selection if you look the same you negate it plants like to get pollen which looks different from them and because of that there's pressure in the environment for the generation of different kinds of pollen so a great example of, of negative selection another example that's really cool is thinking of the flu virus you know how it seems that like every year you have to go to the doctor again to get a shot for the flu? You know, it seems like every year there's a new kind of flu virus and that makes you have to get a new vaccination for it. Well, it's actually funny because the fact that we get vaccinated is what causes this virus to keep changing. The thing is that across the generation of the viruses, as they infect more and more people, more people develop immunity, especially if they're already vaccinated in the first place. And so this virus, if it doesn't mutate, it's going to be eradicated from the population. Because when enough members of the population have immunity against the viruses, the viruses will not be able to spread from person to person and it will end up dying because of that. The progression of the virus will actually uh, be halted when there's enough people in the population which are immune. And that's called epidemiological uh, immunity. When enough people people the population can't catch it, the viruses will stop progressing. Which means pressure is put on the virus to look different from the previous generations because if the virus mutates, then it's not going to be uh, necessarily encountering the situations where the members of the population are going to be immune because a new kind of viruses will encounter people who do not do not have immunity against it and the vaccinations have not been developed for it and therefore it will be easier for this new kind of virus to actually infect the population. So again, there's pressure to, for the virus to look different and that's an example of a negative or diversifying selection. In positive selection, which is called also purifying selection, that's easy to remember because P goes with P, I think of the little kid saying, hey, I love this cake. I want to have it all the time. And so that this is when natural selection favors the look that is common rather than favoring the look that is rare in a population like it was with negative selection. So example of this, for example, look at this uh, animal here, the zebra in the bottom, that looks completely different from the way the zebras are supposed to look. She's a mutant. She has a strange coloration pattern, which will make her stand out in the savanna. And as a consequence, she's actually going to alert the, uh, the predators to its presence, in which will decrease the fitness of of this animal, as well as the fitness of the herd that has this anyways. And together, therefore, those pressures will make this animal be, become disadvantageous in its ecosystem and probably go extinct because of it.
So instead of this mutation becoming part of the population, it will probably be deleterious and cause the, the extension of this specific type of alu or fixation of the opposite. And so that's an example of something that looks different being selected against. Another great example of that is going to be the fact that sometimes abnormalities in humans are actually very rare. You don't see them very often. And that's because the, the, the rare look is selected against. You know, we actually like people that look the same as we do. And, uh, of, of course, uh, this is something that psychologically it's in our brains and we learn about and we're, and we're genetically prone to do it. And it might not be a nice thing, but that's actually what happens. Because it's rare for people who deform is to engage in, in, in reproductive encounters, it's going to actually lower their chances of becoming common in the population. And as a result, the rare look becomes deleted from the population or very, very rare in the population. And yet another example is what we talked about, apostomatic coloration, when organisms have this advantage if a lot of them are going to be around because it's going to become more common in the population, like we talked at the beginning of the video, it will be easier to send a message saying, hey, I am dangerous. And therefore, there's going to be pressure for this look to become common in population, a strange look. So that's negative and positive selection, and sometimes, of course, natural selection depends on how many are in the population. Sometimes we'll select towards uh, making the look become more common, and sometimes we'll try to select for the rare look or to diversify the population. All right, so that's it, and I hope you learned a lot. And on the next video, we're going to talk about sexual selection, which is one of the coolest things in evolutionary biology. I'll see you guys then.